Joe Arthur! He hasn't got the hood in his head. What happened to me? A young man cut down in his prime. Blood was pouring out of his fist. One man may hold the key to this mystery. I, I don't know, man. I don't know. Witnesses don't always tell you everything. As Lieutenant Joe Kenda zeroes in on the shooter, he uncovers a tale of manipulation and greed. We're now starting to see a different perspective in this case. It begs the eternal question, what is the human life worth? You become very cold in this business. Violence is what you do. You're surrounded by it. You're knee deep in it. It's your job. You find who did this. That's what you're there for. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's a quiet Sunday morning in Southeast Colorado Springs as Mary Bassett begins her daily prayers. It was very comforting to her. She always had her Bible. Sundays were peaceful, nice way to start the day. The particular prayer that she was reading talked about how we know what love is and how we should be willing to give up our lives for our own brothers and sisters. She gets up to see what it is. Here's the squeal of tires that car is leaving the area. I would imagine she was just trying to get her head around whatever was happening. Across town, Lieutenant Joe Kenda is enjoying the scenic ride to Colorado Springs Police Headquarters. It was my time to just sit back and relax. Time to sort of ease into work. But Kenda's easy morning is about to go up in smoke. Go for Kenda. Radio cracks that there is a shooting victim at St. Francis Hospital. Be advised, the victim is in critical condition. He was brought there by a friend who is also being treated. Then four, I'm around. Kenda. I'm going to go straight there for two reasons. To find out what the condition of this person is. And what does this witness know about how this came to happen? I pull into that ER parking area. There's a green vehicle, passenger car, here with the door open. Yeah. Hey, Doc. Good. So we got? I don't know a whole lot more than you do right now. We just got here before you. The officer tells me that the victim is Arthur Gibbs. He's 20 years old. He was brought into the hospital by a witness. In that vehicle, the green car. Who's that? That's the nurse that admitted him. That's it. How you doing? I understand you were the admitting nurse. Uh, you talking about what happened? Start from the beginning? Yeah. I was organizing files, uh, and this man came bursting through the ER doors, uh, screaming that his friend had been shot. Help! Please help! I need some help! My friend's been shot! Come on! You got a gunshot, Victor? Grab the gurney, let's go. bruised, he was covered in blood. We just got a gurney out here and got him in as fast as possible. What happened to me? They immediately extricate the party from the car and get him into surgery. He's bleeding profusely from a gunshot wound to the face and another gunshot wound to the back. We don't know if it entered the brain cavity. In the case of gunshot wound to the face, 90% of the people die. What? and die before they reach a hospital for treatment. Arthur is alive, so it's perhaps he's among the 10%. Can you tell me about the man that brought in, Mr. Gibbs? Yeah, his name is Isaac Watson. The nurse explains that the witness is 33 years old, and they are checking his face to see if he has any further injuries. And they just say where his friend got shot? Which neighborhood? Yeah, uh, several blocks away. He told her that the shooting actually occurred several blocks from the hospital at the intersection of Cimarron and Institute. And you mentioned that his face was bruised up. Yeah. Have you been fighting with the victim? He didn't really have a lot of details. 
Hey, Riz. What do you need, Legion? Did you find out when we could talk to Isaac Watson and uh, make sure you test his hands for gunshot wrestling? We'll do. No one has ruled out as a suspect until the facts say so. It's not unheard of that two individuals have an argument. These could be friends. It escalates to physical confrontation. Somebody gets wounded, shot, or killed. At which time the friend usually jumps in and tries to help. Is that what happened here? Well, I don't know that. But it's certainly among the things that concern me. Before questioning Isaac Watson, Kenda examines the car he used to drive Arthur to the hospital. Yes. There's a large quantity of blood across the front passenger seat. Dirty. Yeah, we also found this. Is that a bullet hole? That's what it looks like. The officers point out a bullet hole in the seatbelt release mechanism, which would indicate that perhaps that's the bullet that hit him in the back. So Arthur was sitting here when he was shot, and the nearly vertical trajectory tells me something else. GSR test. Watson's test came back negative. Let's see what it said. His hands say he didn't fire a weapon, so Mr. Watson is looking less and less likely to be the person responsible for this. As Kenda and the investigators process the car, they find another surprise. Check this out. There is a knife stuffed in the cushions in the front seat. And that knife was bloody. So your thoughts right away are... Did this shooting occur because there was a fight going on? Somebody got stabbed, and in retaliation, somebody got shot? There's one last thing that catches Kenda's eye. What's that? It's a jacket. There was a white jacket in the back of his car. Now, we know Mr. Gibbs is wearing a dark-colored jacket. We know Watson is wearing a light-colored jacket covered in blood. Sure. Whose coat is that? Lieutenant Kenda. I was thinking about that jacket when I'm approached by Officer Webb, who tells me he heard that Arthur is the victim in this shooting, and I said he is. Yeah, why, well, you know? Yes, I recently met him. I was called out to his mother's house on a domestic call. Did you know? Please don't leave. Don't touch me. Please, I'm sorry. Officer Webb went on to explain that the mother had developed a relationship with a Gary Hilton who was her semi-boyfriend, but was also verbally and physically abusive to her. <laughs> Arthur and his mom needed Gary Hilton financially. And to some extent, I'm sure his mom needed Gary Hilton emotionally. He paid half the rent, uh, but that came with a price. Uh, and that price was emotional and physical abuse. She finally got fed up with it. And with the assistance of her son, Arthur, they threw... <laughs> Fighting for his life. And we have Gary Hilton. 
in a recent violent argument with our victim. While officers track down Gary Hilton, Kenda and his team head to the street corner where the shooting allegedly occurred. It's a very nice little area, Color Springs. A lot of middle-income homes. This is not where Arthur lived. So the other question becomes, well, is he at the intersection of Cimarron and Institute at 6 o'clock in the morning? Did you find anything? I didn't see anything. All right, uh, why don't you go knock on the doors? So where do you suppose the car was parked? Because I'm not seeing anything. I have no idea. The intersection of Cimarron and Institute as the crime scene. That's a large area. Scenes are, as you find them, they're not always perfect. They don't always have identifiable evidence present. This is Kenda. Uh, why don't you wouldn't bring Watson down to me along with more officers on campus. In the meantime, let's block off this whole intersection. I want to get Mr. Watson down there physically so that he can be specific about what corner they were sitting on. Officer Webb to Lieutenant Kenda. Go for Kenda. It's Officer Webb, and he reports that he has information as to the location of Gary Hilton, the estranged boyfriend of Arthur's mother. Lieutenant, I don't know if this is going to be good news or bad news. Colorado Springs Police Department. I was unable to make contact at the door, but a neighbor came out. Hey, they're not there. They got evicted. Arthur's mother... And Arthur moved out of this residence. His mother moved out and had gone to Tulsa, Oklahoma to visit her mother. She further said that she also knows Gary Hilton. And he immediately moved to California, which was several days before the shooting. I've made a few phone calls and I was able to confirm that information, sir. All right, thanks for letting me know. So we've eliminated someone that looked promising as a suspect. But we still have other things that have to be resolved. More than ever, Kenda and his team need to talk to Isaac Watson, who's been given clearance by the hospital to travel to the crime scene. There had to be more behind what had occurred. Ms. Watson. And the police were very anxious to find out what had occurred. So tell us what happened. We were parked right here. We were just trying to figure out what we were going to do for the night. He points out which corner and says that he and Arthur were sitting in his car. He and Arthur were just talking. Who is this? When this dark colored vehicle approaches and comes to a screeching halt. Hey, Lieutenant. Check this out. We clearly see side pressure scuff marks from tires that confirm his story. What happened next? That's when he came at us. Watson tells me that two Hispanic males get out of that car. One is wearing a black trench coat. He comes up on the passenger side of the car. The other guy's got a rifle. Go, 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 give us some money. Go, go. Oh, 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 come on. Oh, oh, oh. They don't have anything to give them, and the fight ensues. Give us the money. Come on, give me money. Give me money, give me money. Give me money right now. And the yelling and screaming and demands are going back and forth. He hears two gunshots. He looks over at his friend. He sees blood pouring out of his face. Both of Hispanic males ran back to their dark color car that was being driven by a third Hispanic male. Oh my God! And they sped away. Isaac is really emotionally upset at this time when we talk to him. Officer, you want to search this whole area for evidence of a shooting? Yes, sir. They searched the area, and they found nothing. No casings, no projectiles, no ballistic evidence whatsoever. Although Isaac Watson's story is plausible, Kenda hopes that he can at least explain the evidence found in his... I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know anything about that. He suddenly becomes evasive. When you're vague and when you don't come forth with all the information that you have, it's going to raise some questions. Mr. Watson, this is your car. What do you mean you don't know? The jacket might have been Arthur's. I don't know. Well, Arthur's wearing a jacket. So it's the first indication that Watson is lying. So there's obviously more to Mr. Watson than meets the eye. Witnesses don't always tell you 
everything that occurred. They may tell you little bits and pieces to match what the evidence may show. I know you're upset. I'm going to let you go. We will talk again. I wanted to plant that seed in his mind that his story isn't working. So he's aware that I will come back to him. Kent is certain Isaac Watson isn't being completely honest, and the facts of the case are still proving elusive. Until an officer uncovers another piece of evidence. Go for Captain. Lieutenant, you're going to want to take a look at something. I'm two blocks south of the intersection. You right there? This is James Jones, the homeowner. So what are you telling us, James? Well, I came out to see what all the commotion was about, and this is what I found. There's fresh blood on the fence. You want to get a tech out here to get some uh, photographs and sample? Looks like there's some more over here. Thank you. Yes, sir. So now that we have this other blood evidence and Watson being reluctant to talk about a knife and a jacket, maybe this isn't an attempted robbery at all. Could the white jacket belong to an unidentified third person? Told you, man. What's up? And could this third person have gotten into a fight with Arthur? Get out of my face, man. A knife fight. Get out of here. Maybe this is a fight between people that know each other. Not far from the bloody fence, investigators find another clue. We start following what we believe to be a blood trail. It goes through a yard and ends up underneath a picnic table. This could be the owner of the jacket in the back seat. This could be the guy that maybe gets cut with that knife in the front seat. For the amount of blood. Looks like where was here for a while. Let me check with the hospitals? Yeah. So are they hiding? Are they drunk? What are they? Rest of the dispatch. Detectives contact nearby hospitals to see if anyone has been recently treated for knife wounds. Dispatch, go ahead. This is Ritz. There was a male who came into St. Francis earlier this morning. His name was Pablo Ortega. He was treated for severe cuts and then released. Okay, thank you. Let's go. Pablo, we're close to the scene of a shooting. This could be important. It doesn't take long for Kenda's men to track down Pablo Ortega. Outside the residence, Kenda and his team prepare to make contact with their new prime suspect. This could result in a gun battle in the next 10 seconds. So you just want to be prepared for anything, because when you knock on the door, you don't know what's on the other side. We knock, the police knock, the kind that wakes the dead. Police, open up! As the door starts to slowly open, my first concern is... I hope I can see your hands. If I can't see your hands, you're going to see a gun. At this stage in the investigation, Arthur Gibbs is fighting for his life at St. Francis. St. Francis says they treated a Pablo Ortega for a serious cut. We believe he may be a suspect in this case. We're about to confront him. Police, open up! Let me see your hands! What's going on? Is Pablo Ortega in there? Yes. We need to speak with him. Pablo Ortega? Yes. Step out here. Quit search. We explained to him why we're there. We say there's been a shooting at the intersection here by your house. I don't know anything about a shooting. But you were involved in an altercation with somebody. I get the knife slash on your hand. It wasn't a knife. He goes on to tell us that he was out the night before with his girlfriend, Ernestine Martinez. She wasn't feeling well, so he took her home. He drops her off at the house, he gets ready to leave, his car won't start. So when he goes back to Ernestina's door, I mean Rodriguez, Ernestina's stepfather comes to the door. Hey, what are you doing here? The problem is, her stepfather doesn't like Pablo at all. My car won't start. I don't care, you stay away from me. I don't want to see I don't want to see my daughter. The front door has a large window pane in it. When the stepfather tries to slam it... Stay away from here! 
Pablo breaks the glass and cuts his arm. Hey, what the hell are you doing? You bring my freaking door. Now the stepfather is enraged. Come here. I'm going to kick your ass. Ernestina's stepfather started chasing him. And that's why he ran and was climbing over fences and hiding in people's backyards. I can take you and show you where I cut myself. Minutes later, they arrive at Ernestine's parents' house. See, look at the front door. There's a big piece of cardboard over the door. There's broken glass on the porch. The glass has blood on it. Pablo's story is true. It is a major coincidence that we have another issue going on that left a blood trail that was real close to our shooting scene. Thank you for your cooperation. Give you a lift home. The next day, Kenda and his team regroup, trying once more to put the pieces of this puzzle together. Hey, Lieutenant. Just got the lab results back on the knife that we found in the car. Okay. The blood on the knife actually belongs to Arthur. Probably a drainage wound. It is blood soaked from the wounds in our victim.
How specifically? Crack. You know, Arthur was a smoker. We're now starting to see a different perspective of this case. We're seeing individuals involved in drugs. Raymond explains, to help Arthur escape his troubles, he and Isaac pooled their money and bought him a little pick-me-up. I'm not lonely. Yeah. Ah, no more! <laughs> they have been up all night smoking crack, buying crack, until they're absolutely flat broke. <laughs> and they still wanted to smoke some more, so they were thinking of ways to make some money. It was all Arthur's idea. For once. A way to make some more cash. How'd you do that? I said, like, sober. You know, bunk junk. Bunk junk in this case would be very simply something made to look like crack cocaine. His plan is to take a bar of soap and ship it with the knife he has in his seat. Cut pieces out of the bar of soap. And they look remarkably like crack cocaine. Not just salt people, but... But I didn't stick around to say I know so well. I left. Did you leave anything behind? Yeah. I later realized I left my jacket behind. And he correctly described the jacket we found. After hearing Raymond's story... And the extra jacket? I, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. It's now clear why Isaac Watson lied to the police. You don't want to talk about the drugs. You don't want to talk about the soap here. We're going to go run up Mr. Watson and re-interview him to see what else he can tell us. We appreciate your help. Is there anything else you think we should know? Yeah, but like I said, I left before it all went down. But as I was walking off, I do think I saw the guys I did. A black car pulled up with three Hispanic males. He said he recognized the driver anymore. It's Anthony Veal and his butt are who we're looking for. You mind sticking around for a little bit? I'll show you a couple of pictures. Things like that. Okay. You hungry? Oh, uh, sure. I'll give you some. Be right back, right? Okay. While Kenda has officers out rounding up Anthony Veal and Isaac Watson, the victim takes a turn for the worse. Unfortunately, he never regained consciousness. Arthur Gibbs is dead. Now it's a homicide. Shortly after Arthur Gibbs is pronounced deceased, police arrive at the home of Anthony B. Hill. When the officers go out to his residence, we see a black car. It's consistent with the statements. Anthony B. Hill? Yeah. Hi, Colorado Springs PD. We'd like to speak to you downtown about something. Do you have a minute? I can't. I gotta take my sister to the airport or she'll miss a flight. I'll tell you what, we don't want the young lady to miss her flight. Could you come afterwards? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. We don't have probable cause for an arrest. But we should do some cooperation. We generally get some cooperation. After Anthony drops off his sister, he sits down for a chat with Kenda. And then Lieutenant Kenda, this detective writes. Look, man. I don't know nothing. He didn't know nothing about nothing. He didn't know anything about a shooting. He's never been to Cimarron Institute. Anthony is a criminal. He has a history. His immediate denial of anything to do with anything is your first clue that he's involved in it. You don't know anything at all. I was with my girlfriend last night. He doesn't offer a stranger as an alibi because a stranger might not go along with it. The girlfriend's loyal and he knows it. Hip to the game Anthony is running, Kenda once again plays the good cop card. Look, Anthony, we appreciate your cooperation in all this. Would you mind taking a polygraph? It'll just help us iron out a couple things. Sure. I'll set that up. They are an indicator of guilt or innocence, supposedly. But the only value to a polygraph, in my opinion, is if it elicits a statement. What's these? Hooked up to the polygraph machine. Polygraphist starts asking questions. Are you wearing shoes? Yes. Do you own a black car? Yes. 
Were you with your girlfriend last night? Yes. Okay, Anthony, this test is over. After the test, the examiner steps out of the hallway with me and says he is lying through his teeth. Now it's time to confront Anthony. We want to really attack Anthony V. Hill about his statement or his lack of truthfulness. We want to make sure we have all our ducks in a row. All right, Raymond. So we put together a photo lineup of Anthony while he's sitting in the photograph suite. We show it to our eyewitness, Raymond, the backseat passenger. Do you recognize the driver of the black car from the morning when Arthur was shot? I sure do. It takes him less than five seconds. He looks at this photo lineup and immediately identifies Anthony V. Hill. Thank you. Give me just a minute. I'll be right back with you. So I think just to confirm your statement, you don't know anything about the shooting, now murder. That's right. Well, Anthony, the polygraph says different. Furthermore, somebody who knows you said that they saw you in your car at the scene. Isn't that odd, Anthony? Don't you think that's odd? Anthony's now nervous. We've hit him with the fact that we know he's lied. Listen, we know you were there. I can just charge you with murder right now. We can tell us what happened. Okay, I was there, but I didn't shoot anybody. Who did Anthony? I'll tell you all about it. Cool. That's what I wanted. We were finally able to identify the driver of the suspect vehicle, Anthony Vigil. We have him in our hands, and he has decided to tell us what happened. The truth, finally. He admitted that he was there at the scene, he was driving the car, but he didn't shoot anybody. He says Carter Villarreal is in the back seat, and Leo Arguello is in the right front passenger seat. Describe Leo for us. He was wearing a black trench coat, and he's got acne scars on his cheeks. That's the description Watson gave of the shooter. Look, I know Leo and Carter did it, but I didn't see exactly what went on. If you want to know that, you're going to have to ask them too. Loyalty in the criminal world only applies in conversation. It never applies in reality. While Kenda's team works up warrants on the two suspects, he receives some unexpected news. You want us to bring in Leo Arguello and Carlos Virion? Right. They're already in county. They were arrested two days ago for robbery. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for coming back in. After bringing Raymond Baxter and Isaac Watson back in, Ritz puts together two more photo lineups, which include his new suspects. Let me know if you see the other two people from the car. Get a closer look. We showed a photo lineup to Raymond and Isaac, and they're both able to positively identify these two individuals as being the other two individuals at the scene. What's that? Yeah. This guy. This guy. You sure these two? Those are the two. Okay. That's what we need. Thank Raymond you. is allowed to leave. We've got all the information we needed from him that we're going to get. Oh, Isaac. You're not going anywhere. Sit down. Isaac's not allowed to leave yet. What's, what's going on? First off, I need to tell you, my friend Arthur's dead. Now we're going to get the truth from him, finally. Now your friend is dead. And you're part of the reason why he's dead. I want the truth. You owe it to your friend to tell me what happened. Okay. Watson says that they're sitting there selling soap to people and they're getting away with it. They've made a couple of sales. This black car pulls in in front of them. Yeah, I got some. Be right back. So 
Arthur goes and manufactures the crack. And Isaac stays up there to keep them busy talking to them about nothing to give Arthur time to make his product. Now, is Arthur committing a crime by selling somebody a chip of soap? No. He is, on the other hand, doing something incredibly bad. Arthur and Isaac both expect that this car is going to leave. They don't leave. They sit there and they try to smoke it. <coughs> when they realize it melts instead of burns, <coughs> and it's soap. This isn't real. Like so they are wild. Yeah. One of the worst things you can do is actually rip off somebody in a drug deal, particularly when you're talking about cocaine. Why are they coming back? What the hell are you trying to pull, huh? Sorry. Uh, who do you think I am, huh? You know, Larry. Come on, I'll take your money back. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter. Leo is. Leo and Carter drive off at a high rate of speed. Isaac realizes that he's in real trouble when he takes him to the hospital. Those are the facts that we've been trying to learn for a very long time. With Isaac Watson's statement in tow, Carter Villarreal decides he wants to speak to Kenda as well. Oh, good. What do you have to say, Carter? Carter admits to everything, corroborating Isaac's story. Isaac already gave us his full statement. Do you agree with that statement? I mean, I roughed him up a bit. All right, but I swear to God I didn't shoot nobody. He also talks about the murder weapon. After the shooting, Leo wants him to take the bullets and actually the cylinder of the weapon and hide it, which he does. He buries it outside his bedroom window. Is that where it still is? Yeah. We used the metal feet dug there and in an athletic sock. The cylinder and the bullets from the murder weapon. his partner in crime now rolling over on him, Leo Arguello also comes clean. Arguello pleads guilty to second-degree murder and is sentenced to 48 years in prison. The driver, Anthony Vigil, pleads guilty to conspiracy and receives 12 years. And due to his cooperation, Carter Villarreal receives a reduced sentence of five years. Arthur was just so young, he probably didn't have the guidance or the will to really make a decision in terms of what type of man he wanted to be in life. What's really unfortunate about this particular case, the victim's only 20 years old. 20 years old. A death over insult has to be the worst possible reason to take a human life. Case files of Lieutenant Joe Kenda. First, a teenage Romeo promises a girl the night of her life. He wrote his name and number on her hand. But the perfect first date turns into the perfect nightmare. You have nothing to connect anybody to this event. We're going to have to apply pressure to get any semblance of the truth. Then, a desperate husband takes his own life. Or did he? When police arrive, they see a dead man lying on the floor and a weapon next to him. Suicide is one of the easiest ways to cover up a homicide. Can Lieutenant Joe Kenda get to the truth? We don't know what happened here, but we need to investigate. Is this what it is said to be? We live in a free society. You're free to do whatever you wish. And sometimes what you wish gets you killed. There's one thing that never changes murder. A life has been taken. 
Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's Saturday night. An 18-year-old Tyro Larry is looking sharp. The uh, friend wanted to throw a party. You know, there was going to be a lot of girls there. Everybody thought it'd be a good idea just to, you know, all get together and enjoy ourselves. Tyrone's little brother, Tim, arrived at the party a half hour earlier. We would just uh, come go there and, you know, mingle. There was uh, a good amount of people there already. This was a big party. There were a lot of kids. And they were crammed into a two-bedroom apartment. A lot of people were drinking. People were just talking, dancing, and stuff like that. Tyrone spots his brother Tim in the crowd. What's going on? It's good. He was there talking to some girls. Uh, he had two girls on both sides. Who did he play? He's from the other end of the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, bro. Yeah. Must be a thing. It wasn't ten minutes after that that they heard a shot. Everybody hit the deck. Tyrone was scanning the crowd, trying to figure out what was going on. And he looked over into the living room area where he observed a bunch of people kind of gathered around somebody laying on the floor. Come on, Tim. Tim, come on, man. Barry said, my brother is empty. He was shot. Come on, man. Tim, come on, man. Get up, man. He couldn't really say anything. He was just on his chest. I was just telling him to hold on. Just hold on. It'll be all right. Okay, man. Here, okay. Just keep him the comfortable I can. Just let him know I was there. Call the ambulance! Across town, Lieutenant Joe Kenda and his wife Kathy are saying their goodbyes. We were at a dinner party with a bunch of our friends in anticipation of the coming holidays. I was surprised we stayed there as long as we did before something came up, as they said. We made it through dinner. Cheryl. Yeah, nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you. I'm 
with them, so he really thought us up as, as ladies, man. And um, if they go to the mall all the time together, and see who talk to the most girls and stuff like that. Carol almost immediately had a crush on him. Uh, what are you guys doing tonight? I don't know. What? Uh, my boy's having a party, and you should tell me. Yes, I'm off the almost. Maybe. Um, do you have a pen I can borrow? There's something about this that seems so teenage boy dashing to me. She wrote his name and number on her hand. So, I hope to see you later. Okay. I will. Maybe. Maybe? Yeah. All right. Okay. I'll see you later. Bye. We'll keep this. <laughs> you want to get it back at the party? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm at the party. We came to the party, and at first I couldn't find anything. There's lots of people there. Everybody's drinking, so they too drink. Timothy did show up, much to <laughs> Cheryl's happy pleasure. He kind of made a beeline for Cheryl. And so they were flirting to beat the band, and that was making things more fun. The party was loud, and there was music, and people were talking and laughing and dancing and drinking. And she looked away for a moment from him. <laughs> a loud noise. She turned and she sees the victim shudder and fell down directly to the floor. Then I heard Arthur yelling. I couldn't believe it. Did you see who shot him? <laughs> it happened so fast. It's always possible for witnesses not to see the shooter in a noisy, crowded party. Did Arthur see? Yeah, probably he was right there. Yeah, maybe, probably. He lives here. His roommate, um, Bobby Dickerson, is right over there. He was the one DJ. Yeah. I already told you, man. Tim was my homeboy. I ain't had nothing to do with this. Right, we're just trying to help. So, what do you help us out? Tell us what happened. All right, well, me and Art, we moved in together three days ago. So we decided to throw a little party. They were very excited because this was the first apartment they'd had together, Bobby and Arthur. He's busy being a disc jockey. Now I know where we hear this bang. He said he looked out the window and he had served two black males, Timothy, and not anyone else in this apartment. We have to know what happened, and we don't know that yet. pressure these people to get any semblance of the truth. According to apartment resident Bobby Dickerson, the shooters were two African-American men in red jackets. But that's not all. According to Bobby, they purposefully targeted the victim, Timothy Pert, as part of a deadly gang dispute. That blood, that's who it was. That's who did this. And that's the people who shot my whole board. Bobby was nervous telling us about the blood. The blood started in Compton, California as a protection gang against the Crips. The Crips' color is blue. Their arch enemy are Bloods. That street gang wears red. Looking at Bob Dickerson and the other eyewitnesses, Kenda and Walker quickly put two and two together. The kids all were wearing blue. They've got a bandana sticking out of their pocket or they've got a blue baseball hat. Everybody at the party was holding blue cups. In the 90s, that was the time in Colorado Springs when the gang infestation was just getting started. There were some guys that were coming in from the coast, but there weren't many of them. Seeing faces and names. I just seen red. You know it was trouble. Other witnesses from the party confirmed Bobby's story that the Bloods were behind the shooting. You know who these guys were? Slobs. Slobs is a derogatory term for a Blood member. With the eyewitness statements in tow, Kenda and Walker's next move is to track down the two Bloods who are allegedly responsible for the shooting. We are going to make some attempt to either find them or dispel this theory. Come on and uh, show us where you saw the shooters. All right, man. 
They both walked out the back this way. Bobby Dickerson says that's where they ran. We set a perimeter based on how far you can run, and we searched four guys that match that description. Open up a description of the suspects. Let's also talk to neighbors. Fan out about three or four blocks. The grass is high, the grass is wet. He says that's where they ran, but there isn't a mark in the grass. Police don't find any footprints indicating the suspect's direction, but Kenda hopes there may be something else left up their trail. When people commit shootings, they tend to throw guns. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. No weapon is found. No anything is found. Mr. Dickerson's story is getting weaker by the second, and I explained that to him. Look, Bobby, none of your downstairs neighbors saw anybody in red go by. Now what people tell me that are you and your friends. Yo, man, I'm telling you, it was some more cast lives. Dickerson's demeanor is one of evasion. He doesn't want to talk to me. All right, then. Any bloods in particular have a beef with Timothy? Anyone, Bobby? Yo, look, I told you everything, all right? What else do you want from me? He's not any part of this. And he's as innocent as the driven snow. Well, probably not, Mr. Dickerson. Take him to homicide. Put him in a box. Let's go. As police wrap up the crime scene, Kenda is certain the story about the Bloods is bogus. But why would the party goers lie? And what was the real motive behind the shooting? In all of the interviews we've conducted so far, no one has suggested that there's any reason for Timothy to be hurt. We could not determine that Timothy had any problems with any other person. That just doesn't make sense to me. Hoping the victim himself can provide the answers, Kenda and Walker head to the hospital. But the news isn't good. Hi, we're here to check on the street victim. Sorry, he didn't make it. Take that in for a moment. You know, a 16-year-old boy, 16, he's never going to see 17. Has mother been notified? Yeah, she's here. She's uh, down in the waiting room. She's upset, but says she wants to talk to the police. Thank you. She was really torn up. Um, my mother took up really hard. We was very close. Timothy was a loving person. He would take his shirt off his back for you. He was like the heart of the family. It was really difficult on everybody, though. Sorry for your loss. We're going to get to the bottom of this. She went on to explain that Timothy is a nice kid. He does well in school, and he's a good son. He does have friends of his who claim to be Crip members, but he's not part of their lifestyle. Can you think of anyone that do this to your son? I know exactly what happened. I don't know, Timothy. She tells us that earlier that night. She was on her way to work. Timothy asked her if he could go to the party. Come on. It's Arthur and Bobby's new apartment. It's a big deal for Arthur. I don't want them getting you into any kind of trouble. But, Mom, it's not like... I said no, Timothy. When I came home from work, I seen policemen everywhere outside. And that's when Arthur came up. Her comes up to her. He is crying. He is very distressed, and he says, I shot Timothy. What, so what are you I'm so saying? sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that is a critical moment. We've gone from guys in red coats to a grieving mother who names the shooter as Arthur Jones. His best friend who lives in the apartment where Timothy died. He described to us that they were like brothers. They hung out together. They were inseparable. Oh, my, my, my. It's not a gang thing now, is it? What happened to Arthur? <laughs> he ran off. <laughs> you gotta find that boy. <laughs> you know where he went? He went to uh, Saban Junior High School. <laughs> He's gonna kill himself, is what he said. <laughs> we put out his name as physical description. Apollo, be on the lookout. We want this individual for murder. Yeah, Detective Walker, the dispatcher. He is armed and considered to be dangerous and possibly self-destructive. We sent uniformed officers over to the school to check for Arthur, uh, but he was not located. With another young life on the line, Kenda heads to homicide to put the pressure on Arthur's roommate, Bobby Dick. 
Bobby, I know it's not the Bloods. Arthur did it. We told Tim's mom he's gonna kill himself. I told you I don't know anything. Look, Bobby, right now we're just trying to save Arthur's life. Now, where the hell is he? Okay, okay, okay. Yo, all right, I can tell y'all some of the places he hangs out at. You're not gonna tell us, you're gonna show us. Let's go. We took Bobby and drove places to see if we can locate him. Bobby out of the car, and he went to talk to this female. Uh, have you seen Arthur? I really need to talk to him. When Bobby came back to the car, he had a tear in his eye. And the news is exactly what no one wanted to hear. The street says that Arthur's killed himself. As he said he would, he's dead. Is that what's really true? And he wasn't moving. 
moving. Arthur was down there with him and screaming. I'm not going to get up there. Arthur is totally panic stricken and then he runs off. Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of here! Don't wake up! We think Bobby was the one that initiated the blood, committed this crime. When the police show up, don't nobody mention Art's name, all right? They know Arthur Jones. They want to protect him from the police. So lay this off on some Mr. X that ran off into the darkness rather than Arthur Jones. It doesn't matter, sadly that it was an accident. You don't get a do-over. The reckless behavior, it made it even more tragic that it took this life. They're really good friends. They're the best of friends. They've been really good friends for a long time. And when Arthur said, you know, I killed my bro, he was being serious. They were like brothers. Everyone in patrol, everyone in investigations is beating the bushes for Arthur Jones. He says he's going to kill himself. We already have a young teenager that is deceased. What we don't want is two lives to be lost. Thankfully, the next morning, the search for Arthur Jones ends peacefully. Happily, Arthur did have an aunt and uncle that stopped him from ending his own life. It took three hours for the aunt and uncle to talk to Arthur to get him to find himself in. On August 28, 1993, Arthur Jones pleads guilty to criminally negligent homicide and is sentenced to two years in prison. Forgive him. He didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. I know it was. For the rest of his days, he will think about killing his best friend. Timothy should still be with us, but he's not. That in itself is worse punishment than anything a court could provide. Coming up, a case that seems open and shut is anything but. He didn't witness it, so the obvious question for this caller is, how did you know this was a suicide? It's early morning, and Lieutenant Joe Kenda is called to a residence on the west side of town. Walker was at the scene. So we got now they're saying it's a suicide. He informs me that patrol was summoned to this address as the investigation of a suicide. Is that William Grudowski he was 32. The police respond to all reports of death to determine method and manner. He was married to Holly, his wife, who is only 19. Here's an older man married to a fairly young girl. I think that there was a father figure between William Grudowski and Holly Grudowski. Inside, Kenda and Walker find Jay Perez, the Grudowski's roommate, and the man who called 911. I'd like to ask you a few questions if you don't mind. Sure. He said Bill and Holly Grudowski only lived there about two to three weeks. They were living there to help Jay with his rent. Can you walk us through what happened this morning? Well, um, I was awakened by some noises. It sounded like a muffled yelling. I just know that 
I had a bad coke cap. I think he was kind of at the end of his rope. He is someone who has had a shady past. Minor drug dealer just sells small amounts of cocaine and eats out some money from that. Holly and Bill didn't even have a car. They didn't have a place to live. They basically were looking for handouts. It's, uh, about a month ago, Bill got worried. He thought the cops were going to bust him. William uses cocaine. Cocaine induces paranoia. William tells his wife, Holly, if they catch him with this much product, he's going to jail for a long time. I'm not going back to prison again, man. No way. Holly decides to resolve this threat, taking the cocaine and flushing it down the toilet. Brilliant. But Holly didn't fully understand the ramifications of her actions. It was not her property to flush. The drug supplier supplies the drugs. As Bill deals out that cocaine, he pays back the drug supplier. What did you just do? I, w I was trying to help. What the hell were you thinking? You said the cops. The cops. Where do you think we can get the money to pay my guy back? I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man. Drug suppliers do not sue you. They do not send you a nasty letter. They come to where you live and they fill you full of bullets. William knows it. Now the lovely Holly has almost guaranteed his murder. They needed to lay low because they knew that people would be out looking for them. After learning of Bill's predicament, Lieutenant Kenda and Detective Walker can see why he might have wanted to end it all. If all of this stuff is piling up on Bill Gradowski, he knows that the only way he's going to get out of this is hit rock bottom. And rock bottom could be suicide. Well, I appreciate your help. I'm going to get an officer to talk to you in a minute. Inside the guest room. Kenda and Walker encounter the lifeless body of Bill Grudowski. We see him lying on his back. Damn. It's a hell of a way to kill yourself. We also see a sawed-off shotgun that's laying next to him. There's blood everywhere. It's on the furniture. It's on the carpet. They see a big gaping hole in his chest. There's no doubt that he's been shook. They get a few surprises. We roll the body over, and when we do that, a pistol falls out of the inside breast pocket. Hey, look at that. That's just weird. Why would Bill Kredowski shoot himself with a sawed-off shotgun and not the pistol that he had in his pocket? It was a big red flag to them because they thought, this just doesn't make sense. But the biggest red flag of all comes when they get a look at Bill's back. They see that he was actually shot in the back. You would expect the entrance wound to be in the chest. He has been shot at extremely close range between his shoulder blades with a shotgun. And unless he works for Cirque du Soleil, he didn't do that. Holly. Where is the terming Mrs. Krusky? Because she ain't here right now. Originally the call came in that a person in this apartment had taken his own life. Our examination of the scene indicates that that is not the case. Suicides have a certain look. That is, ain't it? Okay, turn to bang. 
Essie leave the residence. Because Holly was in the bedroom at the time that Bill Kradowski was shot, we needed to find Holly. People who commit a crime, they have a very great tendency to run away. So now the step is find her. But before the homicide investigation gets off the ground, a man named Terry Reynolds reaches out with information. I got some information about what happened at the house today. It's extremely rare in murder cases to have an eyewitness announce their presence and say, I know what happened here. You were there this morning? Yeah. Okay, so it's as early as 5 a.m. Bill says he needs to ride somewhere. So Terry tells us that he actually goes and picks up Bill, and they go to a location in the downtown area called Rich Springs. Hey man, we're here for a minute. Go ahead. Buying cocaine. Thanks for riding, man. Oh, you Hey, one favor? When we get back to your place, can I take a piss? A resource. They drank way too much coffee this morning. Like, cool? Sure, man. He was in the bathroom when he hears a loud bang. He finally comes out of the bathroom. He finds Holly in the living room. Did what? Who did what? Well, he, he shot himself. I was about you have a car, right? Yeah. I, I can't be here, so I, can, you, can you help me? Yeah. Please just... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Terry says they drive off. While they're driving, she's very upset. She's crying, she's hysterical. He stops at a red light. And I'm like, well, we gotta tell the police. And she, like, runs out the car. Mr. Reynolds seems completely believable. No reason to believe he's involved in this. Terry, I saw the body. Bill didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. He was shocked. Are you kidding? No. I don't care about things like that. Can you think of any reason why Hollywood decided to murder her husband? It wasn't a happy marriage or anything, but Bill had a, had a temper and that was it. I get a complete drift from Mr. Reynolds. He knows more than he's telling me. Kendon decides the best way to crack the nut is to let Terry go with a nudge to his conscience. Well, Terry, I want to thank you for coming forward. I can tell you're someone that uh, knows what's right is right. Would you decide you want to tell me everything? Just give me a call. Dude, I told you everything. I know. Everything. Bye, Terry. You think he'll call? Well, if he doesn't, maybe I'll throw his ass in jail. While Kenda heads back to the office, Detective Walker reaches out to Bill's relatives to learn more about his marriage to Holly. I always felt really bad for Holly. Bill's family, and I love him, but he was not good to her. Holly was probably afraid of Bill. He was somebody who was very controlling over her, but yet they lived this lifestyle that put them in harm's way. A short time later, Kenda gets a visit from a familiar face. Terry. I wasn't completely honest up front. I apologize. Just want to come and get my story straight, and I want to complain about everything I know. He apparently took what I said to him to heart. Have a seat. He tells police that Holly did not, in fact, jump out of the car and run into the night, never to be seen again. I actually drove her to Where is Holly? So he took her to a friend's house. What was his friend's name? His name's Matt Carr. to the address provided. And Mr. Carr resided in Trader Park. That's where he dropped her off. Yes. What was the Colorado Springs apartment? We asked him if he knew where Holly Grudowski was. She's, in fact, asleep on the couch. When was that? She told me she was in a lot of trouble and then she was going to go to jail for a long time. She just went over to the couch and that was that. She just basically passed out. Yeah, I really felt sorry for her. Might have recommended. Yeah, sure. Matt Carr accepted Holly as a guest because he knew William Grudowski had 
an awful lot of cocaine. That he was abusive to Holly verbally and physically. It's time to speak with Holly face to face. Oh, 
Hey, hey. If uh, an individual racing his can. This guy needs some help. Right away, notice he's on the verge of dying. Hang in there, buddy, okay? Across town, Lieutenant Joe Kenda is hard at work on another case. I was considering a case where we had an individual who installed a barbecue grill, and when he ignited this affair, it exploded, blowing him off of the deck of an apartment building with third degree burns over 90% of his body. But how did this happen? I'm gonna talk to her girlfriend. She's upstairs. She says from and complained that it was badly made. So we tossed the instruction manual and these parts. Yeah. He said the instructions were stupid. There was absolutely nothing wrong with the grill. What he failed to do was install several parts that limit the gas supply. Kendo rules the case in accidental death. It's always best to read the instructions by the people who built this thing. They probably know more about it than you do. As Kenda finishes offering his condolences. Dispatch to Kenda. Over Kenda. A new case is thrown in his lap. Be advised of a shooting on Point of Pines Drive. The victim is being transported in extremely critical condition. It's an attempted murder. We assumed that we would remove the word attempted before lunch. Minutes later, Kenda pulls up to the scene on Point of Pines Drive. That's what we got. The victim is James Cooper. Jimmy Cooper, actually. I went to high school with him. Really? I'm sorry to hear that, Ray. I didn't know Jimmy that well, but it was difficult for me to imagine that he would be involved in something like this. As the owner of a small consulting business, James Cooper is well respected in the area. I just think before his transport? Yeah, he looked pretty bad. Is this Mr. Cooper's car? Yeah, he was down in the front seat. There was a lot of blood on his face, on his arms, around his neck. Check out the seat next to where he sat. It's a 22 caliber revolver. We were told by the EMTs that the victim had small caliber wounds. So this gun is probably the weapon used to shoot him. Did you get a picture of the serial number? Yes, I did, sir. She said that someone tried to obscure the serial number by scratching it, probably with a screwdriver blade. Why? Because it doesn't lead to them. See if they get the serial numbers off it. Hopefully, whoever scraped it off can do that their own job. Next, Kenda turns his attention to the ground outside the driver's door. I know there are a lot of EMTs around through here, but uh, looks like there was quite a struggle. Yeah, it must have been. There was some kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat going on. I think they were struggling with the gun. Could have been. It's a possibility that complicates Kenda's investigation. <coughs> if the shooter flees. As Kenda pulls over the physical evidence, something else catches his eye. What is that? There's a folder, and it's laying right next to the truck. It's like something a lawyer would use. There's nothing in it. It doesn't appear to be part of this. Is it there because somebody dropped it there and had nothing to do with this event? Of course. Do I know that? No. And make sure to process that for fingerprints. Sure, you're fine. I know those two guys have found a victim. Yes, there they are. Thank you. Kenda turns his attention to the two landscapers, Chris Blazer and Mark Jordan. Thank you. One time, Kenda, might I ask you a few questions? Sure. Was the guy conscious when he found him? Sure was. It was awful. While they were waiting for medical assistance to arrive, the man that had the injuries was trying to talk to him, but was having a great deal of difficulty. Uh, what? Is, what did he say? It's, it's okay, man. Hey, an ambulance will be here soon, okay? Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Just hang in there, buddy. Kind of muffled, but kind of sounded like he said he burned me. 
You burned me. Yeah. You're wondering, what do you mean? You got burned? He's trying to say something. Maybe he's trying to name the person. Maybe he's asking for help. Who knows? Thank you, sir. Absolutely, sir. With a slew of mysterious clues, this shooting is shaping up to be a real whodunit. But an incident across town is about to turn the case on its head. I need to call the police. I need to call 911 now. Give me the phone. Are you okay? Everything was all red on his shirt. His eyes are swollen. I'm at a gas station on uh, Garden of the Gods Road in Centennial Boulevard. I, I was with my business partner, uh, and there was a gun. Yeah, it, yeah, I, I know it went off once. He wasn't sure whether or not the other guy had been shot. You just gotta get here quick. Yeah. Steve's friends with my husband. 
she was kind of taken aback. Steve and her husband were business partners, good friends. What type of business is your husband in? Um, he owns a company that does business removal consulting. Jim Cooper is described by Mrs. Cooper as an outstanding business person. He's well respected. Always be sure to wear gloves, okay, guys? Because of Mr. Cooper's intimate knowledge of the complexities of asbestos removal, he offered a training program because it paid very well. Jim was kind of the premier trainer in Colorado. There was a lot of folks out there doing that type of training. Jim was heads above the rest of Steve came to get training, and apparently he was a really good student. Jim trusted him, and they formed a friendship. How's business been? It's been good. It's been so good that a few months back, Steve proposed that Jim and him go into business together. We need to get out of this teaching. The real money and the removal. Yeah, I know. But honestly, I'm no salesman. I mean, I'd still try and get no clients. That's where I come in. Mr. DeVito had told Mr. Cooper that he had contacts in various companies and organizations and financial institutions that could be of great aid to the business. My father knows some serious players in the city. Old infrastructure buildings because they need asbestos removal. Now, these are contracts with money up front. As soon as we get started, we start making money. Back in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of money to be made in this business. Look, we get one of this guy's buildings and we're set. He's got 12. They together started an asbestos removal firm. Jim invested $9,000 into that business. They've just now said it, but Jim thinks that there's potential for growth and lots of money to be made. He was promising Barbara that their life was going to change. They were finally going to cash the big one in. Mr. Cooper ran the asbestos removal business itself, while Mr. DeVito was his lead salesperson. We have a business meeting coming up, right? Randy Weaver, big time money man. He was a good talker. He was a people person, a little more outgoing and aggressive than Jim. Have you noticed anything unusual between Steve lately? Jim is usually really easygoing and relaxed, but the past few months he's just been stressed and, well, like, secretive. And then there's this thing that happened. As recently as a week ago, something had gone wrong between DeVito and her husband. Jim and I drove to Steve's apartment and they got in this big fight out front. Steve and was so upset with him, he threw a stack of papers in Steve's face. Get out. What? Sorry, honey, but Steve and I gotta go for a drive. Then he actually yelled at his wife Barbara to get out of the car and that him and Steve needed to talk. Him and Steve drove off. He just left me there and then when he came back, he went and told me what it was all about. Mrs. Cooper, do you know if your husband owns a handgun? So he asked Barbara, has she seen that gun lately? She said, no, I haven't seen it in a long time. I appreciate you. Your thoughts right away are, well, perhaps Steve was right that Jim did bring the gun to this meeting. We are going to get to the bottom of this, my friend, whether you want us to or not. Detectives shift their focus to Steve DeVito and his relationship with James Cooper. He's 25 years of age, and he reports that he's from the state of Illinois, but he lives in Colorado Springs at this time, and he has a wife, and he has two small children. So you're Mr. Cooper's business partner? Uh, well, yeah. Tim kind of takes the lead. He has more business experience. But recently, he's been acting really strange. How so? Just so uptight and tense. I didn't know what was wrong with him. He also mentioned that in the prior week they had this confrontation, that Mr. Cooper threw papers at him, and they had this private meeting in the car. What the hell, man? What? You're supposed to come through with all the contracts you promised me. It, it, it's just going to take a little while, man. I told you, it just takes some time. Let's say it better come. Jesus Christ, Steve, I have a family to think about. And Mr. DeVito was fearful of violence. He was afraid that Cooper would hurt him. He said I was doing a bad job and threatened me with physical violence. So this morning when he called and said he wanted to meet up, I was kind of nervous. So I suggested Point of Pines Drive, just, you know, somewhere outside where anyone could see us. Steve said when he arrived at the meeting location, 
this event? You gonna approach Jim's car? Well, dude, dude. <laughs> Mr. Cooper has a gun in his hand. DeVito thinks it was a 22. What's going on? Come on, man. <laughs> and that's when the fight ensued. DeVito attacked him in an attempt to recover the gun. <laughs> Somehow the gun went off twice. Even DeVito. Is he a colonel past? We don't know enough about him yet. Sir DeVito, do you own any guns? Absolutely not. I never have. I'll tell you what. I'm gonna step out for a bit. There's a few things I want to look into before I let you go. Stay put. Thank you. As I come out of that room and leave him to his own devices, I'm told that his wife, Mrs. DeVito, has arrived in an investigation. She has something she wants me to see. Hi, Mrs. DeVito? Hi. Um, is my husband in the other room? No, I ignored it, because I don't want her talking to him right now. Uh, what was he want to give you, Mrs. DeVito? Proof that Jimmy was threatening my husband. And then what exactly am I looking at? So, Jimmy came over the house the other day. And he just starts threatening Steve, and he just throws these papers in his face. When I read those interior pages, it's a fantastic tale that the man said. that ended in gunfire, and he's just accusing the other of being the guy who pulled the trigger. Now Steve's wife has brought me some paperwork that sheds light on their disagreement. I'm going to need to take this. Thank you for coming. Okay. The first page is a standard business agreement between Mr. Cooper and Mr. DeVito, but that's the only thing standard about the document. Mr. Cooper hereby agrees to provide me, Stephen DeVito, with all of his bank accounts, access to his savings accounts. I will have full ownership of his business. Hey, Erickson, you gotta come here and take a look at this. In this contract, it's indicating that everything that Jim owns, he was signing over to Steve. Signed by Jim. Check this out. Paper holes. Page one and the last page are a standard sort of business agreement that says that they are going to be equal partners. But someone has put different pages in between page one and what probably was page two. Don't look at me like I'm stupid. What the hell is this? Yeah, this is in fact truly a fraudulent document. This could explain why Jim was so upset with Steve. This is our business agreement. <clears throat> See, the funny thing is, someone slipped in a few extra pages, signing all of Jim's worldly possessions to you. What? That's really bizarre. So you're back to I don't know and I don't remember. Yeah. I remember seeing it and thinking that it was really strange. I kept meaning to bring it up to him. I mean, I'm not off to cheat my own partner. He looks extremely sincere. People who lie to the unpracticed eye can be extremely convincing. Some sort of but to me, mistake, a joke even. He's a pathetic liar. I'm beginning to believe that Steve's fraud goes deeper than this phony agreement. Supposedly, he's this well-connected guy capable of bringing in business. I'm not buying it. Yes, the question is about your education, Mr. Vito. Did you go to high school? Yeah. College? No. Did you ever take any business or finance courses? No. You ever remember any exclusive social clubs? No. Okay, thank you. Now, what has he just told me? That his history does not say he's capable of doing what he says. That he's going to obtain multi-billion dollar contracts. I'm thinking, Mr. DeVito, you are as full of crap as a Christmas turkey. So am I free to go? I don't think so. 
He shot a man. Whether it was self-defense or not, it's in my discretion to put you in jail for the night. In the meantime, I'm going to drop us off at the frog unit. I, I want a lawyer. You're going to need one.
body of a female. Yeah, of course. The body is that of Steve DeVito's mother. When he is arrested, he confesses to doing it. He says he had a great reason. He claimed self-defense. So he felt in danger from his mother. His parents had divorced when he was one or two. And he was left in the custody of his mother, who was absolutely, bizarrely, and hideously abusive. What the hell are you doing? I'm, um... I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning up. Oh, you're cleaning up! Oh, really? This is a plane! I, I just... What? I just... Abusive what? in the physical sense, abusive in having him witness her have sex with men and if not in person showing him pictures of them i i i did you do everything right did what i told you worthless she was his biological mom but she wasn't his mom deal with it deal with it deal how with dare it. you talk to me that way he indicated that one night he and his mother were in an argument leave me alone <laughs> she had apparently threatened you kill him repeatedly. You're pathetic. I hate you. Pathetic? How do you like this, you little She left the room and came back with a shotgun. <laughs> he actually shot her in the face. According to the incident reports, after shooting his mother, Steve hid her body in the basement. They had one of those great big chest freezers, so he opened the lid, put her inside, closed it, went to McDonald's and the movies. Ballistics 
lab has been examining the 22 found in James Cooper's car. I believe it to be Steve DeVito's gun, but the serial number is scratched off. Hopefully they were able to decipher it. It's a painstaking process, but most of the time you can get a good portion of that serial number to reappear. It's a six-digit number. I was able to make the middle four digits visible. The first and last aren't so clear. Okay, the uh, middle four digits, 5691. That's it. How'd you know? I have the receipt for the gun right here. Four of the six numbers are on this receipt, and the two ones that you have difficulty reading could easily be the three and the seven, correct? Yep. That's my gun. With Steve DeVito already in custody at the El Paso County Jail, Kenda now has enough evidence to charge him with attempted first-degree murder. However, Kenda still wants a complete statement from his victim, James Cooper. So, after several days, we were able to go to the hospital to check on Mr. Cooper, and he's recovering. The doctors say he's extremely fortunate. The projectile should have killed him, but it didn't. So, how are you feeling? Well, thank you. Most people do not survive being shot twice in the face. Are you allowed to talk to them? Yes. It's remarkable. We were able to speak to Mr. Cooper and have him tell the circumstances and how they came to be. So can you tell me how you came to know Steve DeVito? Everything started all right. He came to my special seminars. A really bright young man. He had no idea Mr. DeVito had been in custody at one time in his life for murder. He didn't know that. All he knew is what DeVito wanted him to know. My father knows some serious players in the city. Old infrastructure buildings that need asbestos removal now. Mr. DeVito started to tell Mr. Cooper that his father is an enormously successful business person and is extremely wealthy. We're talking the university, movie theaters, the football stadium. These are contracts with money up front. As soon as we get started, we start making money. A true sociopath can be a very attractive personality. You know, he seemed to have the keys to the safe. He seemed to have all the contacts. Just all seems pretty risky. No risk, no risk. Look, we'll do the one job, get the money in, you can sit on it if you want. It's a win-win for both of us. What do you say? Now, Mr. Cooper is being lied to in a, a phenomenal way, but it's not that he is being lied to in a impossible way. All of that could be true. So you decided to go into business yet? Yes. But weeks turned to months, and they didn't sign a single client. Where's all this business you're supposed to be bringing me? Don't worry, okay? Everything's in the pipeline, right? These are top dogs, okay? They're going to have to check your credentials, and it's going to take a while to get the ball rolling, all right? Just relax, it's okay. Any minute now. They were supposed to be getting this big contract, and you kind of felt bad for Jim at this point, because Steve kept setting him up. Steve wants the forest to have a limousine pull up in front of their business. Is that your dad? Yeah, sorry, man. He's just in a big rush today. Uh, you'll meet him soon. You'll meet him soon. All right. But Jim got to realize pretty soon on that, yeah, I don't know if this guy's telling me the truth. I think he's conning me here. Then he went through the checkbooks and noticed that some checks were missing. Hi, uh, can I speak with the bank manager, please? He called the bank and stopped payment on those checks. He do not know what happened to them. He's beginning to have some questions about this and starts looking through other documentation, and he realized something was really wrong. But according to James, it was only after his lawyer reviewed his business agreement with Steve that he truly understood just how thoroughly he was being fleeced. I've been reviewing the paperwork, and I'm a little concerned. According to this document, you're signing everything over to him. Did you agree to this? <laughs> this, this, is, this has got to be a joke. Takes it back to Steve's house. What the hell is this? These are the papers he throws at him. How did those pages get into our business agreement? Dude, I, don't, I swear I don't know what you're talking about, man. Yeah, I know what you did. Oh, my God. I think, I think my father's behind this. Your father, really? Just let me talk to him and we'll get it all squared away, okay? Oh, you better. Mr. Cooper started to wonder about Mr. DeVito. And DeVito felt it. He had to stop it. Hello? Hey, Jimmy. Great news, buddy. What is it? You know that big contract? I got it signed. Yeah, man, let's be first thing in the morning. You know Porta Pines Drive? Yeah, yeah, I know where that is. His whole plan was to meet Jim and to kill Jim. And, and therefore inherit everything that had been laid out in that contract. That was Steve's plan. I don't know why I went. 
I knew he was kind of conning me all along. I just figured, what if? So you figured you'd go out and check out this big contract and the off chance that he was telling the truth? Yeah, I figured there was no harm in it. He drives up there, and there is Steve in his car. Mr. Cooper is pleased. He thinks there's the documents in a document folder. DeVito shoots him twice in the head. And to ensure he's dead, DeVito starts to strangle his partner. Then Cooper fights back tries to gouge out his eyes and during that fight somehow DeVito loses control of the gun drives to the gas station and announces he's a victim easy easy oh, I appreciate you talking to me James Cooper's statement further solidifies the case against Steve DeVito Steve decided to plead guilty to attempt a second degree murder Steve was eventually sentenced to 28 years in the Colorado Department of Corrections. As for James Cooper, he makes a full recovery. He resumed his life, was successful, and is still carrying on. The best thing I can say about Jim is the businessman, family man, and someone I call my friend, is someone that's always there to support you. He has always been there for me, no matter what I've needed. These kinds of crimes people don't recover from. It's a scar on your heart that you have all of your life. Mr. Cooper was forced to live with that. Mr. DeVito is where he belongs, in the can. Two investigations from the case files of Lieutenant Joe Kenda. First, two escaped felons terrorize civilians across the city. You know the potential for violence is very high. Whoa, man, I'm cool. It's up to Lieutenant Joe Kenda and his fugitive task force to capture them before they strike again. Authorities are looking for the whiskey bees. These are a real complex. They're very dangerous men. They do not want to go back to jail. And they could oh. kill the wood. Then, a young mother is savagely murdered. It's a crime of passion. It's brutal. Police must determine if this was caused by a broken heart or an act of revenge. When people are betrayed in a relationship, all restraint leaves them. The Color Springs Police Department and all of its members are the thin blue line. It's the line between good and evil. And when good men and women stand up, evil have chance. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for victim. If you go, I will find you. It's a gorgeous Sunday morning in Fremont County, southwest of Colorado Springs. Fremont County is very pretty. It's a combination of foothills and a lot of iron terrain and beautiful red sandstone formations. Sunday mornings are quiet around there. People were at home having coffee, sleeping in after Saturday night, or in church. So, not a lot of activity. Things are particularly quiet at Fremont County Courthouse. We have a jail deputy escorting two prisoners. Raymond is in Douglas Hall to the courthouse law library so they can do some research on their investigation. Thank you. Next, he uncuffed all first. And as he prepared to release Price's left hand. Okay. Relax. Security. Let's talk about this. If you want to talk about it, let's just relax, okay? Using his keys, they were able to remove their irons, their leg irons, and their handcuffs. I hate this. Understood. Cool girl. What's her name? Stacy. I'd like to see her. Get down on the ground. Mm -hmm. Couple. We'll move. Let me do it. They rummage his pockets, get $40 out of his wallet. Let's go. Let's go. And they flee the scene. Two days.
days later on north side of Colorado Springs, Lieutenant Joe Kenda is in the middle of a busy morning. We always investigate suicides to determine if they are in fact self-inflicted and that's what I was in this particular morning. Anything else? He left a note, but he did say why he did it. All he said is he loved Waffle Kids. You cannot find reason in the odds of it. And I always told the surviving family that fact. I don't see any signs of foul play. Go ahead and write up as a suicide. Yes, sir. So I move on to something else. I have too many things to be responsible for to remain present at all these different times. He notes to Kenda that list of crime scenes is about to start growing exponentially. All units, be on the lookout for two escaped students from Fremont County, last seen in the 100 blocks of East Fountain Boulevard, wearing civilian clothing. I was aware that two convicted felons had escaped from the Fremont County Jail by overpowering a guard, and they were armed with his weapon. No one really believed they'd show up in Colorado Springs. The fugitives are two white males, Raymond Price and Douglas Allward. They're supposed to be on foot and armed and dangerous. This is a Fremont County case, but it becomes ours when they're in our jurisdiction. I don't want to lose a citizen. We need to apprehend them as soon as is humanly possible. As the lieutenant in charge of major crimes, it falls squarely on Kent's shoulders to apprehend the fugitives. Can I get an update on those fugitives? Uh, how do we know they're here? A young woman in her vehicle went missing in Fremont County two days ago. I'm informed that she's been found bound and gagged and terrified in her car on East Fountain Boulevard in Colorado Springs. The victim reported it was two prison inmates who kidnapped her. We have officers at the scene awaiting your orders. With the stakes this high, Kenda will need to pull resources from several units under his command. My job is to prioritize in the most efficient way possible my limited resources. Is that a Kenda Sergeant Waters? I start advising my fugitive detective supervisor to take control of perimeter search around that car. I want a four-mile perimeter set up on that abandoned automobile. Make sure you search every car and building. Now that's a big circle. Lots of buildings, lots of businesses, lots of private homes. Yes, sir. We got men on the ground going to the door right now. The fugitive unit's sole purpose is to apprehend who wanted on arrest. The last thing you want on your back is a fugitive detective because he is going to end you. He's going to do so pretty quick. Kendo races back the station. All news networks alert the city's resident. Two Fremont County jail inmates overpower escaped from a guard there. Authorities are looking for the two escapees. Douglas Ward has a record of armed robbery. Raymond Price was awaiting to sing for rape. You sir, real convicts. They're very dangerous men. As owned. The car was discovered near a mechanic shop on a small road in an out-of-the-way place. What do we got? The young lady was involved. She's on her way to Memorial Hospital. She's in terrible condition. CSI's working on the car for fingerprints and pictures. The human right one that found her in the car this morning. Thanks. Sir. Turns out he's a young man in his early 20s who works at the mechanic shop. So what happened here this morning? Well, I was walking to work and I passed by a parked car and I thought I heard something from it, so I stopped to check it out. He walked by, he heard angel sounds coming out of the car. It was odd because he didn't see anybody sitting in the car. Wait. victim tied up in the back seat of the car. Oh my god. Hey, you okay? Well, what happened, Arthur? They kidnapped me, they have a gun! Who has a gun? The inmates that escaped from jail, they just left you, have to call the police now. She tells her, release her, that this just happened to her a few minutes ago. So it's very possible they are in the area. All right, just wait right here, I'm gonna get someone, okay? And so it's raining as fast as I could call you guys. Did you see anyone fleeing the scene? I'm sorry, I didn't. Thank you for your time. Here's an infield of fugitives here who requested for Sergeant Waters. Great. Uh, what can you tell me? They were both recently transferred to a local jail. They had been convicted of very crimes and they were awaiting sentencing before they escaped. We know that Raymond Price has a history of kidnapping, rape, and assault. The most 40 years of age. This guy has been around the block. Uh, somebody went on the street. Second one. His partner, the Lamb, is 29 year old. Douglas Allward, who is about to be sentenced for burglary and theft. And this is interesting. Sources say his dad worked in law enforcement and found PD. Really? For some on the force, the case of Douglas Allward hits especially close to home. So I knew Doug through his father. And, and Doug was a good kid. Something changed in his life when, when he reached about 17 years old. He ran from home and, and started life a crime. He's also pretty disturbing stuff. Look what? You know that Allward had a violent past where he actually attacks an individual's really couple with scissors. It is incomprehensible what would lead a person to do that. 
lived, but this guy didn't know him. He escaped from two different prisons the second time. That's when he corroborated. It is always interesting to have a CPs who are armed in a city environment as we are. They do not want to go back to jail, and they could kill to avoid it. So, uh, why were they here in the Franks? Who were they now? Well, Price has a wife. Look. There you go. He needs help. He is going to try to contact her. So where does she live? What area of town? Because we are going to surveil her, and we're going to be waiting for them. Morning in Kid City. It was the same morning two Fremont County jail inmates, Douglas Allward and Raymond Price, overpowered and escaped from a guard there. Tammy was found in her car by a man arriving for work at a downtown Colorado Springs machine shop. She said, please help me, help me. I've been kidnapped. Fugitive is very commonly avoid city because there's so many police, there's so many eyes looking at them. But Price has an ex-wife in Colorado Springs, and he needs help. We want to contact her and get whatever information she can find about Raymond and try to track him down. That same afternoon, Detective Ramirez with the Fugitive Unit makes contact with Raymond Price's ex-wife, Jennifer Wright. I saw on the news you go. I hope he catches. So we need your help. When we spoke with Jennifer Wright, we found out that she was very upset with him. I got to reach out to you. No. After everything he put me through, you know he picked up a hitchhiker, raped her, and then the following year he kidnapped his realtor. He's a monster. You know he may still try to reach out to you. Well, he should know by now we'll do him any good. I would love to figure out that son of a bitch. She tells the officer she is willing to help the police bring him down. Well, okay. Please do. Thank you. Even though Jennifer seems to be cooperating, Kenda and the Fugitive Unit aren't taking any chances. If she has them in the past, she will help him again. You trust no one? We wait and we watch. Thank you, Uncle Kenda, CSPD. Sheriff James, Fremont County Sheriff's Department. Thank you for your help on this one. Of course. It is very common in every state that agencies help each other as required. We all work together very well. The victim's been cleared by medical, but she's still very traumatized by the whole thing. They're hoping the kidnapping victim, Tammy Smith, can help them locate the fugitives. It was Sunday morning. I was going to work at the drugstore, but I was running late. She starts toward work. It's halfway toward the building. And realizes she has forgotten part of her uniform. These guys need transportation out of the area. She becomes their ride.
the owners of the cabin actually showed up. So they ran out the back door of the cabin through the woods and went back to the car that they had hit. So now it becomes a chaotic system trying to somehow stay out of cover. And they decided then to drive into Cubs Springs. Doug decided that I was slowing them down, so he just put the gun in my head and he said, we don't need you anymore, we're going to get rid of you. You have done nothing to hold us back. We're going to have to get rid no, of you. No, please don't kill me, please. Please. Get down. Stay down. 30 minutes. Don't make sound. Or I will kill. Let's go. They leave her in the back of her own car, and they run away on foot. She was fortunate. They could have gone another way and turned. Right. I know this is difficult, but I want to ask you one more question. Do you remember the location of the cabin where they took you? It might help us figure out where they're going next. I think I saw a sign for Phantom. Phantom Canyon, Washington Canyon, in Heller County. I think so. Lieutenant County Dispatch. When we check with Teller County, they do have a cabin break-in. Very consistent with what her explanation was. The Springs family reportedly came to their mountain getaway at Teller County on Sunday evening. When arrived, they were surprised to find some people trying to get from them. They saw a man and a woman in one direction from A-frame cabin and another man running in the opposite direction. Very but after a lengthy search by multiple agencies, authorities find nothing that indicates where the fugitives are headed. No guns were kept in the cabin, so other local burglary reports being checked out. Police just hope to find something that will help catch or price. But later that day, a new lead had police racing downtown. I was closing up my office to go home for the night, and a man came behind me, kept my keys. When she hesitated, he lunged at her, threw her to the floor, tied and gagged her, took her purse, tinning her keys, and fled the floor. Okay, can you describe it for me? The man from the news? Raymond Ray Price? Are you sure? Beverly Stone explains that she is well aware of the escapees. She has near photos on TV. She is convinced that the person that assaulted her was Raymond Price. Was he with him? When she was asked if Douglas Allard was with him, she replied, no, she only saw Brent Price. Can you tell me what make and model of car you have? 88 Blazer. Um, split. Okay. I believe that Allward and he probably argued about what they should do. Allward went on his own, and now Price is on his. Okay, sit tight, we'll be right back. This will be dangerous town. We have fugitives that are nowhere to get that we have to find. 71. We do, but we'll be on the lookout. And we get that to every officer available, every agency in the immediate area gets that information to Within the hour, the bolo seems to pay off. A woman calls in on the tip line and reports that she's seen Raymond Price in the mall parking lot on Academy Boulevard. We received a number of officers to that area immediately. That mall was then shut down. Every vehicle was searched as it was leaving, and it garnered a lot of new attention. Before coming to the spring, they've they already committed some serious crimes, so the assumption is everyone in the area is probably in danger. We have some other Unfortunately, Raymond Price was not located there. We do that he still is in the car's area. It becomes a very frustrating, stressful time for these officers. As the sun sets over Colorado Springs, Kenda knows it's going to be a long night. It's getting late, but it doesn't make any difference. I'm obviously going home. Kenda. As I reach my office, one of my fugitive detectives calls in and says, Hey, we just got a call from Jennifer Wright, the ex-wife of Raymond Price. They're going to be meeting outside of Bowling Alley off Circle Drive. Did she say when? In the hour. And she's agreed to help us? Definitely. She wants his ass locked up for good. Right away, our thought is we're going to saturate that Bowling Alley with undercover officers. In less than 15 minutes, the fugitive unit is in place at the Bowling Alley. That's her. We allow Jennifer Wright to enter the parking lot. We tell her to get out of We want the bait to be clearly seen. We have to assume that he's armed and willing to do anything to stay out of custody. She's risking her safety. We're trying to minimize that risk by being able to respond. There's a lot of adrenaline being pumped. You know that the potential violence is very high. You're ready for whatever's going to happen. You have to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Price appears out of the shadows. Okay, all hands on deck. We are 
prepared to make the physical arrest of Raymond Price. Price approaches his ex wife. Pigeon. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I didn't know who else to turn to. She's the only friend he's got, and he's in desperate need of a friend. Let's let him make some new enemies. I, uh, I, I didn't know what to do. Go, 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 go. go. They handcuff him and the party's over. Raymond Price is no longer an escapee. He is an arrestee. 60 hours of freedom is all fugitive Raymond Price had before police wrestled him to the ground Tuesday night. He and cellmate Douglas Allward broke out of Fremont County Jail near Florence Sunday morning. He was transported to Canyon City this evening. I'm coming for you! So it's been the end of a very long day. We have Raymond Price in custody. We are not focused on Mr. Allward. We're just some guys over here check that out. But I see no blips on our radar at the moment. Okay. He's gotten through the net, and he's out in the ocean. But shortly after 1 a.m. the following morning, Kenda and his team received word of an armed robbery that may be the key to finding Douglas Allward. This man's name is Mark Lewis, a bar manager in the southeast side of the city. He's taking trash out of his business, and as he comes out... Do anything stupid, and I will blow your brains out! Oh, man, I'm cool! Good, get on your knees. All right. Which car is yours? It's the one over there. It's got gas in it? Full tank this morning. Thank you. We're gonna empty the two. Get up. Easy. Nice. Hit the door. It took, like, 700 bucks out of the register. And then he uh, locked me in the walk-in freezer. I thought I was going to freeze to death. It could very well have turned into a homicide. He could have froze to death in there, but he was able to uh, get himself out. We have a sighting of fugitive Douglas Howard. The information is put forward to all surrounding jurisdictions. Colorado State Patrol. Description held up an employee at this bar near security just after midnight. Anyone who believes they've seen Howard or have other information about the fugitive is asked to call authorities. He's still his arm. Since the weapons weren't recovered yesterday, we are still considering uh, Doug uh, armed and dangerous. We now know for a fact that Douglas Howard is in this Flint vehicle running somewhere. We have no idea where. We make a, a notification of surrounding states. It would take you about two hours out of Colorado Springs and down to Raton, New Mexico. We just didn't have anything else to tell us where he might be going. So it falls to Fremont Cup to continue the pursuit. He is no longer in our jurisdiction. It's kind of a letdown. You wanted to get him while he was here. But he slipped through the cracks. So several days later, on a Monday morning, one of my fugitive detectives called and said, I news. There was a car chase, including gunfire exchange between Allward and the small town police department in the city of Oregon. He really went out swinging. Apparently no one was hit, but Allward will be extradited from Oregon to the state of Colorado to face charges there. It is a Nobody died in any of these instances that, that occurred when these guys were on the run. Looking over the case file, it's clear to Kenda that the two fugitives had a plan with a beginning, but no end. They had a modus operandi. They would find people, steal their cars, take the money. Do anything stupid, I will blow your brains out. But they'd only plan an escape. There's no thought to what happens next. These guys wanted to be anywhere but prison. Luckily, Nobody died. They chose not to kill one, but they're going to get punished for what they did. Ray Price appeared in court in the Springs today to be advised of the charges against him. They include escape, kidnapping, robbery, auto theft, assault, and burglary. Raymond Price receives 160 years for the crimes he committed while on the run. Douglas Allward is given a life sentence, but this high-profile jailbreak wouldn't be his last. At this time, Douglas Allward has saved prison seven years. Gotta be almost record. Today, the Basal Word is housed in a maximum security facility not far from Colorado Springs. When two bull are over the wall, it's important to hunt them down and not stop until you get them. Coming up, Please get out. a young mother is brutally murdered, and the culprit may be someone close. When people are betrayed in a relationship, all restraint leaves them. Pre-dawn darkness. Colorado Springs Patrol officers John O'Rourke and George Nima are responding to a disturbance call. I think that's it down there. 
the original call was a standard disturbance. There was no details to it. That's the apartment right there. Open up. We could hear a woman screaming inside. Police, come in! Ah! Police, get out! Ah! On the ground! Put your hands behind your back. Okay, I got the knife over here. It was very obvious she had a wound to her neck. I need some towels. Stop this bleeding. Robert. So I went to what looked like a linen closet and grabbed the towel for him. Another female's body on the ground. 71, we're gonna need an ambulance here ASAP. Tell him to step it up. We have a second picking back there. Okay, take care of it. Okay, be still. Sit still. You're gonna be okay. Dispatch, I need a second ambulance at my location. I've got a second adult female victim and a small child. This crime scene was one of the most disturbing crime scene I have been to. Ma'am, can you hear me? Ma'am, can you hear me? I was flabbergasted. Honey, can you stand up for me? I'm gonna go ahead and take you out of here, okay? When I picked up that young girl, she grabbed onto me and latched onto me. I felt like she knew me all my life. Here we go. As day breaks, Lieutenant Joe Kenda pulls out the scene. That's what we got. It's bad. It's real bad. You better get this from O'Rourke. I have to take this right to Child Protective Services. Hey, Lieutenant. So what's going on? Oh, we got here. We found a lady in the back bedroom. Multiple stabbings. She didn't make it. The victim is identified as 25-year-old single mother, Stacy Moore. She was a very loving and giving mother. She was a Desiree. She loved people. She was very, very outgoing. I'd be shocked to hear that this had happened to her. She was a very nice gal. She loved to dance. That's how I met her. I actually introduced her to uh, my partner, and they ended up dating for a short period of time. Any suspect? Yeah, the guy. Carl Parker. Carl is a 23-year-old cook at a local restaurant. Not here. We found people in another room. The man on top of a woman is Carl Parker and his wife, Anne. Any injuries? She's got a minor laceration on her throat. He's going to be okay. Cosmo. He's fine. He is not hurt. He's very, very distressed at the police, and they took him to the police station. Now, with her? No, this is Stacey Brewer's place. Take a look. The questions are obvious. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. What is this married couple doing in this woman's apartment? Kenda hopes the apartment itself might reveal clues. Things are knocked over, pushed around, but there's a lot of blood in the main room of the apartment. Did you recover any potential weapons? Actually, yeah. Can you bring the knife over? Do you do it? Thanks. Police find the knife that they suspect is the weapon, a steak knife. Oh, we found it on the over here next to Hannah Colton. We got here. This is not a weapon brought here for the purpose of killing. Check the kitchen to see if it matches the Stacey movie. From this we can tell, it's just still fully stocked. This property is obviously not Stacy Brewer's based on what's there. So whose property is this and why is it here? That we don't know. All right, let's check better. Yes, we're standing here on the left. There's blood on the bed, there's blood on the hamper, there's blood on the walls, there's blood everywhere. It's a lot of cast off. Looks like the victim was dead repeatedly. Explains that Ann and Carl Parker 
live upstairs from Stacy Brewer's apartment. Okay, tell me about the Parkers. Not much, honestly. They were going to move out at the end of the month. I saw Stacy help him move some boxes out yesterday. All three of them seemed pretty tight. I think Stacy and Ann, you know, they really got well good together. Stacy had not known Ann that long, but they got along well. They were good friends. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Kendo wonders if Stacy, Ann, and Carl were such good friends. What could have led to the violent attack? To use the knife, you have to be within arm's reach of the victim, meaning you are very close and you can look them in the eye. Officer Harold, Lieutenant Kendo. Go for Ken. Got your suspect, Carl Parker, down here, and uh, he's claiming that there's a big misunderstanding. How so? Well, for starters, he says he's had an affair with Stacy. He then said to the officer, I'm not going to go to jail for something my wife did, am I? I'll be dead. Hell had no fury like a woman's storm. And what greater... We're investigating the murder of Stacy Brewer, and we believe, because of the circumstances, Carl Parker is responsible. But now he's claiming the other ones. What exactly did Carl have to say? Well, um, apparently he's blaming his wife. What was I supposed to do? You know, I try, I try to take the knife away from... He says his wife cut him, kissing Stacy Brewer in front of her apartment. Flew into a rage. What are you doing, you f***ing bitch? What are you doing? Attack Stacy Brewer. You have to stop and think. Maybe Carl isn't the suspect after all. We have to at least consider that as a possibility. That would explain the clothes. What do you mean? Well, the two girls were in night clothes. And Carl was fully dressed. Kenda wonders, was Carl fully clothed because he was sneaking downstairs to... Stacy, and somehow woke his wife up in the process. See you later. When people become betrayed in a relationship, all restraint leaves them. They are consumed by rage. All right, I'll send a detective down there. Carl's full statement on record. I would waste your time. He's already lawyered up. Ten four came down. Is one of Mega said. It doesn't imply he's guilty. It only implies he's protecting us. With Carl Parker unwilling to answer any more questions. And it turns to his new prime suspect. The only person left that has any knowledge of what happened inside this apartment is Ann Parker. Is that you'll see her? But as I'm getting ready to go. Hey, boss. We recovered these from Stacy's apartment. You might want to take a look at them. He found a restraining order at an apartment issued by a county judge naming the plaintiff as Ann Parker and the defendant as Carl Parker. It says here he's for life and found worse. Kelly Carl was ordered to stay 100 yards away from him. I presume the 100 yards went to the center chest. So Carl conveniently gets to mention that, but he's blabbering about how his wife is a villain. Abusers are just naturally manipulators because many times they can get the person they're abusing to stay with them and not leave for a long time. They're going to be good at lying. Parker's credibility sailed out the window on that anyway. SPD. I might have asked you questions. Can you tell me about your relationship with your husband? She proceeds to spill her feelings and describes Carl Park as a monster who has verbally and physically abused her. All she wants is away from him. He was furious about the divorce. He wouldn't leave me alone, but I didn't have money to leave him. So Stacy, she was kind enough to let me stay with her. Stacy was kind and good heart, and uh, she offered to and moving with her. That was her trying to get someone. So you're moving boxes in the apartment? Crazy and abusive, but I never ever thought he would actually try to kill me. Can you tell me what happened tonight? Ann Parker says she is spending the night her friend Stacy and Stacy's daughter. Carl came knocking on the door, said he had a meeting with his lawyer and needed some papers I had. I could tell he'd been drinking. She says I was gonna shove them on the door, but the envelope was too thin. I opened the door and he grabbed me by the and says she blacks on and thinks that she might even be dead. The next thing I remember was that office scene over me. I have a difficult thing to ask you. What's your having a sexual relationship with Stacy? What? No. She said Stacy hates him. She won't let him in her apartment because of the way he just made. They're like on water. They hate each other. And I realized that she has no idea. And I have to tell her what happened to Stacy. What? No, no. Parker is dead. It's not your fault. It's God's fault.
I look at her and I say, yeah, no, no, Carl Parker did. Good night, you. <laughs> Even without a fourth statement from Carl, Kenda believes he had pieced together exactly what happened. He's furious about her filing for divorce. He's furious about being served with a restraining order, and he's furious that she's moved in with her friend. His purpose is to attack her. He's going to get even. He cooks up a story as to why he needs her to open that door. I need the papers, okay? I'll get out of here. Give me the papers. Hey, that's not going to work. You put it under the door? Hey, I missed you. Come on, open the door. Don, 
His father comes home and sees his son, you know, basically bloodied. What happened to your face, son? It was Donald. He climbed through the window and attacked me. Are you serious? I'm gonna call the police. Maurice explains his father wanted to protect him from Donald. The culture of this country is to protect our young. He's afraid of what's gonna happen next. It was Maurice's father who, at that time, took the appropriate action to go ahead and notify the police and let the police handle the situation. I'd like to report an assault on my son. Although Maurice's father reported the incident to the police, Kenna knows it's entirely possible that Maurice still took matters into his own hands. Okay. So why did you and one of your boys go over there with a gun? You trying to scare Donald? Whoa, whoa, I don't do that type of stuff. I don't have no gun. No one is ruled out as a suspect until the facts say so. But despite my misgivings, what evidence do I have against him? Zip. I'm gonna let you go for now. We'll talk again later. Brother Diane Willard lived in apartment 305. We're with Mr. Godfrey. She says she's distressed about his death, which means maybe if she has some level of loyalty to him, this is all potentially good. She could be a good source. Say something to Tommy. Donald did not deserve this. After it happened, everybody was in shock. Did you see who shot Donald? No. But my friend Gary Johnson, the guy that came in with me, saw the entire thing. She's telling us that Gary Johnson was the individual that was present inside the apartment with our shooter. This is a very surprising twist right here. But listen, I can tell you you did shoot him. It was Maurice. Well, the witnesses we had said the shooter was a lot older. But Diane's reply throws Kenda for a loop. No, you're talking about Maurice Jr. I'm talking about Maurice Sr. His father, Maurice Sr. shot Don. The father's one, didn't you? What? His father shot Donald Godfrey in the back of the head. That's something I didn't anticipate. We're investigating the shooting death of Donald Godfrey. We just learned Maurice Holmes Jr. is not involved in anything other than he's a victim of an assault. Maurice Holmes Sr., his father, is another matter. Maurice Sr. shot Don. The father did the shooting. I think that's when the light bulb goes on. It's like, wait a minute, we have two Maurices here, and it was Sr. who had actually gone after Don. How do you know Donald Godfrey? We met through a friend of mine. He was one of those people that if he had a dollar left and you needed it, he would give it to you. Everything was great until that incident, Maurice Jr. Diane Willard explains that she was returning home when she saw Donald breaking into her friend Maurice Jr.'s house. And when I got in there, Donald was giving him a hard time, so I stepped in. Whoa, 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 whoa. You hurt me! I was just mad. Because I was like, well, leave him alone. He was a kid. So far, Diane's story matches up with Maurice Jr.'s version of events. I appreciate that. I'll show you out. And in the other room, Gary Johnson is giving his version. We now believe that Gary was the individual in the white shirt that had gone over with Maurice's father to confront Don. Why don't you tell me about Maurice? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm friends with Maurice, you know, senior, so when I found out there'd be something going on with the police, I, I went down there to see what was going on, and, you know, he, he was, was furious with Donald. Junior and Don got into a You have no idea. I mean, I know, man. He's been pissing everybody off lately. He hit my son. Somebody's got to talk to him. He's very agitated towards Don. He goes from having the police handle the problem with the trespass to deciding to start to handle it himself. He says, we're going to go end this with Godfrey. We're going to do it right now. We going to talk to him. Come on. Get up. Let's go. Right now? Get up. Let's go. Gary thought they were going over there for the simple fact of warning this character to leave the family alone. Things changed when he got over to the apartment complex. What are you finna do with this? Just going to talk to him, that's it. No, I'm not finna go in there if you got that gun. Well, why don't you come all the way up here then? Gary was there to have a conversation, and that shocked Gary. We just gonna go talk to him? Ain't nothing gonna happen? You coming? Let's go. All right, man. So Maurice is the leader, Gary's the follower. According to Gary, when Maurice Sr. knocked on the door, he was greeted by Donald's roommate, Tom Schumann. Tell him, I'm not going 
I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Don't have an ID on the male, we do on the female. 
the neighbor identifies the female as a 21-year-old named Ernestina Martinez. Ernestina was very well-liked and worked hard, and, you know, she seemed to be somebody that everybody enjoyed being around. Just before Kenda enters the crime scene, someone catches his attention. There was a woman with a 10-year-old child. An officer was trying to speak to them. This is Ernestina's mother. She's the homeowner. Hey, Lieutenant. Stay with us. Sure. We think so, sir, but we're having a hard time getting a statement. She doesn't speak English, and her Spanish is hard to understand. The officer present explained that this was a very different dialect of Spanish. We think it may be border Spanish. The dispatch is working on getting us a translator now. It's a mixture of Indian, Spanish, and French. It's a very difficult language if you're not familiar with it. What about the girl? Maria Reyes? She's too traumatized right now. We've got child and family services coming to help us out. Maria is the niece of Ernestina Martinez. She speaks English. She's born and raised in this country. But when the officer said to her, were you in there when this happened? And all she could scream was yes. This girl witnessed a very traumatic act, something she'd never witnessed before and probably never will witness again. So it's very difficult to try to get a statement from that individual. Let me know when you get a statement from her. Yes, sir. Thank you. Inside, Kenda observes a strange scene. As you enter this apartment, you find Ernestina Martinez. She's sitting upright in a love seat in the living room. You know, I think I've seen her before. Looks like two bullet wounds. She has a gunshot wound to the chest with no exit, and a gunshot wound to the head also with no exit. Whomever did this to her obviously wanted her dead. I think I removed her. Body seems very relaxed. Just based on what we're seeing there, we believe that... She did comfortably in this love seat when she was shot. She was sitting there and probably didn't anticipate it. No attempt at escape. And she takes two gunshot wounds, bang, bang. It's like our second victim was shot over here. There is a blood pool on the carpet adjacent to her, eight feet or so away. John Doe lost a lot of blood. Yeah, check this out. Not too far from the blood stain is a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol. What is the source of this gun? We have no idea. I'm going to back that up. Generally, when a gun is used in a violent crime, the gun is removed from the premise by the shooter. When you find it on the premise, it could have been used in self-defense or it was used to commit this event. Check the pockets. We know from prior experience, clothing was cut off for life-saving efforts. We recover what we believe to be the victim's wallet from his pants pocket. It's kind of a unique wallet, has a unique marijuana leaf design on it. Not much here. Detectives find no ID inside, but the wallet itself sparks an idea. Now these were in the days when marijuana was not legal in Colorado, it was illegal to possess. So a marijuana leaf on a wallet, well, somebody admires marijuana, somebody uses it. Show me signs of forced entry. No, sir, we checked the entire house. I think our victim must have let the killer in. Maybe drug deal gone bad? Could be. Is there something involved in his past that has caught up with him and has subsequently led to the death of these two individuals? We don't know. But there is something going on here, and we think possibly drugs are involved. We need to talk to the victim, find out what's going on. Thank you. I'm Lieutenant Kenneth, Detective Brits. How can I help you? We walk up to the first decision. The on-duty nurse reports that our other victim has been pronounced dead in the operating room at the hospital. There was nothing we could do to save him. Do we have another name yet? Yeah. It's, uh, Pablo Ortega. He's 32 years old. Wait a minute. I know that name. Now I hear the name and things are starting to click a little bit more. Is it the domestic with Jaime Rodriguez? Ritz and I both recall Pablo Jose Ortega another murder case and we are curious about that because he was involved in a disturbance that involved an injury to him kenda and ritz first crossed paths with pablo ortega more than two years ago arthur lee gordon was shot to death in a parked car he was selling narcotics that were not narcotics they were soap chips in a search of the immediate vicinity of the shoot pablo Jose Ortega. But Kenda quickly discovered that Pablo Ortega had nothing to do with Arthur Lee Gordon's death. What's your problem? Get out! It'll take two seconds. Instead, he was involved in a 
a domestic dispute with Ernestina Martinez's stepfather, Jaime Rodriguez. We know that Pitt had turned physical to where he ended up with the laceration on his hand. Ernestina's stepfather becomes enraged and pursues him on foot through the neighborhood. Pablo Ortega runs in fear of the father and leaves a blood trail from his bleeding arm all the way back to his house. The reality is law enforcement deals with a small portion of the population, two to five percent most of the time. There are certain people that are known as regulars, people that can't stay out of trouble. And as a result, the police routinely encounter them. The stepfather hated Pablo, chased him like uh, six blocks. Yeah, something like that. You know, I didn't see anything to indicate the stepfather was at that apartment. Um, maybe he's split with the mom. Maybe he still hates Pablo. Kenda and Ritz wonder, did Jaime Rodriguez kill Pablo Ortega? And was Ernestina potentially caught in the crossfire? We know that they had a problem in the past. Has that problem escalated to this situation? We need to contact Mr. Rodriguez and interview him. Got a kind of dispatch. I need the address for Jaime Rodriguez. Thank you. So let's go see Jaime and see what he has to say for himself. Our mission is to find the truth, wherever that leads us. We're investigating a double shooting resulting in the death of two people, Ernestina Martinez and Pablo Ortega. We are also aware that Ernestina has a stepfather who hates Pablo Ortega. So is it possible he's involved? Of course it is. We're going to go see him and find out. Can I help you? Jaime Rodriguez. We would talk to you about Ernestina Martinez. Working doll spider. A nice girl. When we contact Mr. Rodriguez at his address, he's very forthcoming with us. Very cooperative. Things didn't work out with her mom and me, but that's life. Obviously, you know Pablo Ortega. Yes. Nothing but trouble. What do you mean? I knew it from the first time that I laid eyes on him. I see I got involved in a relationship with Pablo. He explains to us that originally Pablo was very loving in that relationship. But it didn't last long. He was no good. As they get more and more involved... And why do you have to wear makeup? I like to look nice. You know, look, you lying little slut, I know what you're up to. Excuse me? Who do you think you're talking to? And he talks himself into these fantasies that Ernestine is cheating on him. What's his name? What's his name, huh? Yeah, what is it? Me. You're hurting me. And then he becomes enraged, and then he slaps her. <laughs> Ernestina would come home after seeing him, and she was so quiet, real distant. That's when we started to notice the bruises. Get the bus out. Leave me alone. We begged her to stop seeing him, but she wouldn't listen. I wanted to ring the guy's neck, but it wasn't going to make a difference. We have some bad news to deliver. But Ernestina was shot and killed. about the loss of his stepdaughter. She's not blood to him, but she was important to him. Pablo Ortega also died of a bullet wound. I don't need to speak enough to death. But I hated him. He said, you whatever know, deserved to be dead, it was him. Just one more thing. Uh, where were you between one and two today? Are you, are you serious? I was at work until 5 p.m. Everything about how he says he's truthful, his body language, what he says, how he says it, and as a result, he's no longer a party of interest to me. Well, I appreciate your help. Or should I disturb you? Now, Kenda's interest lies in a new suspect. Well, I'm thinking after speaking with Jaime and having knowledge of their prior disturbances, the likelihood is great that this is a case of murder-suicide. Kenda knows precisely how to put this theory to the test. Good evening, gentlemen. So what you find? She's got two gunshot wounds. One is to the right chest in the area of the right breast, and it goes through both lungs as well as her heart. We killed her instantly. And then she was shot in the head. 
So Ernestina dies instantly. She never saw it coming. Until it came. What about Pablo? Ah, uh, what I show you? He's got a single gunshot wound to the left temple. It's contact range, and we know that because it's got some of this dark gray material that comes out of the, the barrel of the weapon. It's got the carbonaceous ring. Yeah. This is the classic range of fire that we see in the overwhelming majority of suicidal gunshot wounds. He definitely did this to himself. I agree. Right, thanks for the help. Although the evidence strongly suggests Pablo shot and killed... One an eyewitness statement that I can believe. A good statement. Sir, we did manage to locate a translator for Mrs. Martinez. Great. I'll send in Ritz to lead the questioning. Also, set up an interview for Maria and the uh, social worker. Thanks. Within the hour, Kenda sits down with 10-year-old Maria Reyes and her appointed social worker. Maria, my name's Joe. Do you know why you're here? She broke up with him. She moved back home with us. He was very mean to her. He was mad at her. What happened then? He had a gun. He had a gun. I believe that she declined to come back and live with him. I just wanted to talk. You're not going to let me in? Fine. I won't. It's coming in. Her mother agrees to make coffee for them. And Ernestina tells Maria, the child, why don't you go with Grandma and help her with the coffee? Pablo and I have something to discuss. Pablo, I don't know why you're here. I want you to come back. I miss you. No. What do you mean, no? I said I want you to come back and live with me. I don't understand why we're going over this again. We've been through this. So what, you're leaving me? Yes. The mother, she hears the first shot, comes back in the room as he delivers the second shot, and Ernestina said... But Papa isn't finished. Pablo says nothing, puts the gun to his head and pulls the trigger. tragic thing that affected so many people. What happened to end Ernestina's life is a cautionary tale for everyone. Don't ever believe you're going to change his behavior because you're not. And you've got to be smart enough to realize the warning signs and terminate it before it reaches the point of no return.